Welcome to the video Superglottic Goiter. This is a case presentation of an interesting patient with a significant superior pole goiter with superglottic airway obstruction. We discuss issues of perioperative CT scanning and fiber optic exam as well as fiber optic intubation in such challenging patients. We have a very low threshold to check CT scan in preoperative goiter evaluation. It is important, however, to check first TSH. Once the TSH is judged to be normal, CT scanning can be safely performed. Generally, we consider CT scanning in patients with large or bulky lesions, patients who are symptomatic from goiter, patients with significant bilateral goiter, patients where the clinical exam suggests substernal extension, or where malignancy is suspected based on preliminary clinical exam, including patients with vocal cord paralysis or regional lymphadenopathy. CT scanning is helpful to determine the extent to which the goiter extends substernally, the relationship of the goiter to the surrounding viscera, including trachea, esophagus, and great vessels. Uh, it is also helpful in identifying some correlates of malignancy, including patients with nodal disease in the neck, as well as patients where uh, the margin of the goiter is irregular or hazy. This is a patient who had a very asymmetric goiter, left greater than right. This was helpful to recognize based on preoperative CT scanning because this actually rotated the larynx to the right so that the recurrent laryngeal nerve entered in the midline because of the asymmetric goiter's rotation on the larynx. This is the patient's clinical exam. We have offered a classification system for substernal goiter, including type 1, that which extends to the anterior mediastinum, type 2, that which extends to the posterior mediastinum. Within posterior mediastinal goiters, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is displaced anteriorly. Type 3 is isolated mediastinal goiter with no connection to the orthotopic thyroid. This is an example of a type 2 posterior mediastinal goiter, which extends to the contralateral thorax between the trachea and esophagus. In this patient, the recurrent laryngeal nerve was displaced ventrally. This is an example of a patient with a retrotracheal goiter, where the retrotracheal portion of the goiter excavated the nerve the area deep to the nerve and brought the nerve ventral. This is the clinical picture of the patient with strap muscles lateralized showing the nerve ventral to the goiter. Here is an example where CT scanning accurately delineated the extent of substernal extension. This goiter could be extracted through the neck. CT scanning also can be very helpful because occasionally there are clefts within the goiter which can be accurately identified and delineated preoperatively on CT scanning, such clefts can be the site of the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it was here in this patient. The red dot indicates the recurrent laryngeal's location within a cleft of the goiter. This is the axial CT scan identifying again the cleft in the goiter, which was the location of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Occasionally, goiters can extend superiorly and present difficulties in management as it relates to their superior pole goiterous formation. Here are three examples of large superior pole goiters. Here is an image showing normal superior pole anatomy as it relates to the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve as it descends on the side of the larynx. Here is a side view showing the close relationship between the superior pole and the descending course of the external branch relative to the larynx. <clears throat> Diagrammatically, the region of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve can be defined as occurring within this triangular region bordered by laterally the sternothyroid muscle, medially the inferior constrictor of the larynx, and inferiorly the superior pole of the thyroid gland. Here is the Cernay classification of external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve anatomy as it descends adjacent to the superior pole. Meticulous visualization and dissection technique is required in managing superior pole vessels and preserving the external branch. The external branch parallels the laryngeal head of the sternothyroid muscle as it inserts in the larynx. The uh, sternothyroid muscle can, in its superior extent, be sectioned, as is shown in this diagram, to provide added exposure to the superior pole. 
As goiterous formation progressively affects the superior pole region, the goiter is drawn superiorly, bringing it into closer and more intimate relationship with the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. External branch injury is difficult to diagnose but may occur frequently during thyroidectomy. It is frequently overlooked as it may not impact on normal conversational speech but can be significantly important in the professional voice user affecting vocal projection and the higher registries. Laryngeal exam abnormalities are subtle in the setting of external branch injury. The most accurate definitive way to diagnose external branch injury is through cricothyroid muscle EMG. The American Academy of Otolaryngology have recently published guidelines to optimize voice preservation during thyroidectomy. Statement 6 relates to recommended steps taken in superior pole management to protect the superior laryngeal nerve. The external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve stimulates the cricothyroid muscle which causes the anterior tilt of the thyroid cartilage relative to the cricoid cartilage and stretch or elongation of the vocal cord which is important in vocal projection and the attainment of higher registers. Amaletta Galli Circe is a famous opera singer whose name denotes the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. It is said that her external branch was divided during thyroid surgery which was done at a local anesthesia by a Chicago surgeon. This resulted in the loss of her career. Following audio clip is her preoperative singing sample which demonstrates the higher registers uh, in her singing. We have recently reported the normative intraoperative electrophysiologic analysis during superior laryngeal nerve stimulation in patients undergoing thyroid surgery. We have found that the external branch is significantly related, that is recessed and but paralleling the laryngeal head of the sternothyroid muscles insertion in the larynx. This is a reliable landmark to identify the external branch. We have identified the normative electrophysiologic waveform that results in the glottis after stimulation of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. This is a small waveform and an early waveform, that is, it has short latency. There is no damage associated with external branch stimulation. The initial waveform and final waveform during surgery do not differ despite repetitive stimulation. When the external branch is stimulated, the amplitude is a small amplitude, typically about a third the amplitude size of the ipsilateral RLN. The International Neural Monitoring Study Group has recently published extensive guidelines relating to external branch management and monitoring's application to external branch preservation. In this document, all of the various cl anatomic classification systems of the SLN are reviewed. In addition, the document reviews the electrophysiologic normative data currently available during external branch stimulation, and Table 1 documents a useful management algorithm for preserving the external branch. This involves a medial on the larynx stimulation of the external branch and then laterally on the progressively dissected superior pole pedicle negative stimulation. This toggling back between positive medial and lateral negative stimulation assures that superior pole is managed with optimal uh, preservation of the external branch. Our patient M. RQ is a 73-year-old Hispanic female with a five-year history of respiratory and vocal symptoms. These were more prominent at night. Over the last several months, she developed an increase in respiratory and vocal symptomatology associated now with solid food dysphagia. Past medical history is notable for asthma, blindness, diabetes, end-stage renal failure, peripheral vascular disease, pulmonary hypertension and systemic hypertension as well as obstructive sleep apnea. The exam shows a well-developed, well-nourished, striderous but comfortable black female. Neck showed an 8 centimeter right superior pole mass without lymphadenopathy. Fiber optic exam was quite challenging in the clinic. It suggested left cord mobility but the right cord could not be visualized by the overlying and obstructive supraglottic lesion. Lab work was within normal limits excepting for evidence of renal failure. 
CT scanning was obtained. The lowest most cuts show minimal substernal extension with a trachea that was compressed and deviated. Axial cuts through the midpole region showed uh, again, laryngeal indentation and deviation of the glottic airway to the left. Supraglottic cuts showed a l massive enlargement of the superior pole, which indented and uh, narrowed the supraglottic airway, extended under the mandible, and extended to the contralateral supraglottic region. Coronal CT scanning documented the extension of the goiter extensively behind the supraglottic larynx to the contralateral neck. We anticipated that the patient's intubation would be challenging after extensive discussions and CT scan review between surgery and anesthesia. We elected to keep the patient awake and sitting up in the operating room. Her nose was decongested and lidocaine was applied, but the patient was kept awake. Fiber optic transnasal exam was performed. Here we can see the left inferior turbinate the middle turbinate superiorly and the septum medially. The nasal airway uh, was identified and the left eustachian tube and left nasopharynx was identified. At this point, the patient was asked to breathe through her nose. This opened up the palate and allowed us to view the supraglottic larynx. One can only see a small section of the epiglottis. The bulk of the airway is obscured by the posterior and right based hypopharyngeal indentation from the large right superior pole. You can see redundancy of the mucosa at the level of the glottis and the scope was placed through this into the trachea and then the endotracheal tube, a monitoring endotracheal tube, was placed over the scope. The patient was successfully intubated. This is her transnasal monitoring tube anchored and secured at the beginning of surgery. Her postoperative exam showed complete resolution of the hypopharyngeal airway obstruction. The right and posterior mass had been resected and the hypopharyngeal profile had normalized. There was still some redundant mucosa in the, at the level of the arytenoids and the right area epiglottic fold, but the hypopharynx was basically normalized. Cord motion was assessed and was normal bilaterally. The patient noted improvement in voice and, most importantly, a resolution to her preoperative obstructive symptomatology and strider. This case emphasizes the importance of careful preoperative evaluation with CT scanning and laryngeal exam, the application of transnasal fiber optic intubation in patients with airway instability due to goiterous formation, and the importance of neural monitoring and preservation of recurrent laryngeal nerve as well as external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve during goiter surgery. Here we see the specimen path report documented benign multinodular goiter. No pa mal pa bien. And she says that after the surgery, the voice, her voice has improved a lot. When was the surgery? Cuando fue la cirugía. El, Dios mío. Todo que día tu viniste. El nueve. El nueve de abril. Sí. Okay, the surgery was on the 9th of April. Okay. Say ah. Uh, ah. Uh, Hold it out for five or six seconds. Ahora síguelo y continúalo por diez o diez. Ah, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um,